Hola. A ver, por favor, un poquitito de silencio. Si podéis, por favor, terminar de sentaros los que estáis entrando. Ok, so, um, welcome everybody to another conference of our series Let's Talk About Physics, uh, which, uh, as in other occasions, is uh, organized jointly with the Spanish Royal Society of Physics and uh, supported by the uh, Ramon Areces Foundation. I would like to take this opportunity first to show my gratitude to the Royal Society of Physics, whose president, uh, Professor Jose Adolfo Lazcarraga, is joining me at the table. And uh, we are very thankful for their invaluable help and effort to disseminate physics to all kinds of audiences, which is particularly important for us uh, to motivate our students. We're also very grateful to the Ramon Areces Foundation, uh, who are supporting this, this conference, and in general for their support of science uh, through their various programs uh, in research and education. So our speaker today is Professor Carl Weiman from Stanford University. We're very honored by his visit, and I would like to extend him our warmest, warmest welcome. Uh, Professor Wyman is not only an outstanding physicist, proved by his many achievements and merits, including obviously the Nobel Prize, uh, but he is also a renowned educationist. And uh, actually, the topic of the talk today has to do more with uh, the, the education side and uh, has to do with teaching physics. So uh, I guess that uh, both the, the audience and the premises today are quite adequate for that. Uh, actually, I would like to remind you that uh, right after the talk, uh, instead of the usual uh, question uh, time, it will be more like a discussion time, with, uh, which uh, I think will be uh, very interesting and stimulating for everybody, members of staff and students, so I really encourage you to take part of it. And that, that part, that, that discussion, will be moderated by uh, Professor Genaro Guisasola, who is also joining us here. He is a uh, professor from the Basque Country University and uh, staff member of the editorial board of the Physics Education Research section of the Physical Review Journal. So now I will give the floor to Professor Azcara, who will make a more detailed uh, description of our speaker biography. And I hope you enjoy, enjoy the talk. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I'll be brief because we are not coming here to hear anyone beyond Professor uh, Carl Weiman. Let me just say that, as you know, he obtained the Nobel Prize in 2001. And the reason was producing a new state of matter, which now goes by the name Bose-Einstein condensation. He did it with a colleague, uh, Eric Cornell, by uh, achieving uh, this with uh, rubidium atoms, which were cooled very much to temperatures which were very near the absolute zero. Uh, at the same time, or just uh, very shortly afterwards, another person, another scientist, who was uh, Wolfgang uh, Ketterle, uh, achieved the same uh, Bose-Einstein condensate by uh, using uh, sodium atoms and the three obtained the Nobel Prize, one-third each. Let me just say that this Bose-Einstein condensate begins with a letter that Bose sent to Einstein, in which he was rediriving the uh, Planck radiation formula, the famous radiation formula for the black body. Einstein appreciated that it was very good. Uh, uh, he was asked to translate it to German, which, which he did and submitted to an Allender Physique, which at the time was the most important <laughs> physics journal in the world. But uh, immediately he produced two papers because he realized that the discussion could be extended to particles with mass, with mass. 
uh, he realized that if these particles were very near together, very, very near, and uh, moved very slowly, they will tend to coalesce, to join together in a single state, which will be the state of the lowest energy. And this is the Bose-Einstein uh, condensate, as it is called now. Uh, this was uh, appreciated uh, very soon, that it was a very important uh, discovery. And if I remember properly, I am fond of the history of physics, but I'm not certain about the year. I think it was Fritz London who said that this could be used to describe the phenomenon of superfluidity, which had been discovered at about the same time, I'm talking about the end of the 1930s, by Kapitza. However, this is not a very good example because the uh, superfluidity, which was found for helium-4, the key of the phenomenon is that uh, it has to happen with bosons. Helium-4 is, is a boson. Um, I was saying that it was not a very good example because only about 10% of, of this superfluid helium will be in this post Einstein condensate. And this is in contrast with the case of the rubidium atoms and the sodium atoms, which were 100% a sodium con uh, excuse me, a Bose Eisen condensate. But uh, I do not want to talk about this more because uh, Professor Wyman, who is professor of physics and education in Stanford, as it was said already, is here to talk uh, about uh, how to teach students to think like physicists, which uh, is not an altogether easy question. I have been reading, uh, uh, I didn't know that he had written a book, which I have seen this morning, and, uh, but I have read in the, uh, uh, in the net things uh, which he has written on this subject. And I have discovered, my, to my pleasure, that he is not very fond of what is very popular, in, at least in the Spanish universities, which is that the students take notes while the lecture is going on and then study these notes. And I have to say that the best student ever that I have had which was uh, uh, the occasion that I was teaching quantum field theory, would sit in front of me, in front of the lecturer, with anything on the table, just hearing. And I knew that if he asked a question, I had to think twice before answering, because certainly it was not a trivial question. So I think, uh, uh, I mean, he will probably say more, but uh, uh, I have no doubt that uh, the technique of uh, taking notes and then studying notes is very bad, very bad for learning. Of course, there is no easy way to learning. I mean, learning is hard, but there are ways which are more efficient than others because the important thing to think as a physicist, to have the initiative to look at the problem, to see if the problem is wrong, why it is wrong. I mean, if the, the, the solution is wrong, why it is wrong, and so on. He is very committed in this respect and he has even uh, belonged to a commission of the White House. I don't think if I say the, the name properly, but it was like an office for science and research, something like that, where he served for two years. And he has also um, be, uh, been the, um, the force behind the, uh, what it is called the Carl Wyman Science, science and Education Initiative which is devoted to promote good, good teaching in the line that he will tell us. But he has also mentioned two points. When, when I read about uh, his uh, ideas, uh, it struck a chord in me. And it is the problem of having what I would call uh, informed decision. We live in a world with 7,500 million people which is an enormous amount. During my lifetime, I like to say, the world population has multiplied, has been multiplied by three, which, I mean, I'm old enough, but still multiply the population by three is something, uh, I would say, horrendous. And there are many decisions that have to be taken that will be taken in the wrong direction if the people who have to influence the decision takers are not properly informed. And I will mention just two. One is very widely known, and we know the problems that face this, uh, this uh, uh, well, I'll mention it, is the global warming. We know what is happening. And this is happening because there are people still 
doubting that a good component of the global warming is anthropogenic, that is to say, it is created by, by us. But there is another which is not so well known, which has uh, happened in a few years, back in the past, which is uh, and will be which is the editing of the genome. This is already done in many uh, species, and we are, the human species is next in the line. This is something which goes, the technique is something which goes by the name of CRISPR. I will not try to identify what the letters mean, but what in practical terms mean is that there is uh, practically a, a do-it-yourself kit which make is, be, makes very easy editing the genome. This was a technique which was uh, uh, promoted by three people, two women, uh, uh, Jennifer Dudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, and a man who is at the University of Elche in uh, Spain, whose name is, um, uh, well, I should, I should know, uh, Fernando Mojica. And this is really something which may change the future of our species. And there will be... be little time for me to speak. Excuse me? You should leave a little time for me to speak. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> having said that, I will finish and I'll move, I'll move to the floor and have uh, our illustrious speaker to say what he has to say about teaching the students to think like physicists. Thank you very much. Can you get her to set the lights back to the way she, more, more light in the audience, please. Just, just the way you had it was just great. Fine, there, perfect. Um, so I'm gonna talk about teaching uh, students to think like physicists. There's actually a, a little confusion. I thought I was going to mostly be talking to the, to the teaching staff about this and I see most of the audience are, are students, but so the way you should really think about this um, as, as a student is, well, first, I'm not trying to turn all students uh, into physicists, but it's really useful to, to at least get, you know, at some introductory level, no matter what area you're going into, to have some sense of how you can use the thinking about physics in the world around you and making these important societal decisions that you have to make. But also, um, you know, a lot I'm, is going to be about teaching, but really the, what I'm going to be talking about is how learning happens. And so you should be thinking, if you're a student, uh, you should be thinking about how your learning process or the teaching and learning you're getting matches with what I'm going to kind of talk about. And if nothing else, it'll give you a lot of things you can go to your physics teacher and say, hey, you know, there's a lot better way to teach than the way you're doing it. You should change and you can blame me for telling you, okay? So the way I actually got into this was related to my, my physics research is that I saw this puzzling pattern, which was these graduate students who, in physics, would come into my lab to do research on Bose-Einstein condensation. They had done very well in many years of taking physics courses, doing exams, and so on, but I found they really couldn't do physics when I, you know, that was the challenge, but they clearly had the capability because after one or two years in the lab, they had turned into physicists. And so, after a while, I decided this wasn't just a strange thing about individuals. There must be something fundamental here. And so, I really approached this as a, as a science question, looking at what do we know about how people learn, and particularly how do they learn physics, looking at the research that was out there. And 
this was turned out to be uh, very interesting to me. I discovered that instead of just a lot of opinions, which I'd always been hearing about of different ways to teach better, what was better or worse with teaching, everybody had a different opinion. There really was a science behind this where people were doing uh, serious research, uh, looking at, you know, doing controlled experiments, measuring learning when you taught in different ways at the university level, and you could have, you know, get real data. And so that explained the puzzle with the graduate students. It also got me interested in actually doing this kind of research myself. And so for, for many years, I actually had two parallel research groups. One was working with atoms and lasers, and the other was studying how to teach uh, physics. And, and actually, that expanded into teaching science, how to teach science as, as well. And so I also want to make the point that Although this talk, I was, it's the physical society, so I'm aiming at physics. In fact, everything I say here, it works exactly the same way for all, of, all areas of science. Just change the, the label. And in fact, we've got pretty good data. It's much the same for engineering as well. So, so no matter what, as a student, you're interested in, you can think this will be relevant. Now, the, the research in this area comes from two forms. Uh, one are the cognitive psychologists who look at base, the basic properties of how the brain uh, thinks and learns. And then the other area is doing classroom experiments uh, in the undergraduates in science and engineering. And these are experiments which aren't done by, you know, education faculty. They necessarily are done by pro, uh, faculty, uh, faculty members, staff, in the departments of physics, chemistry, biology, et cetera. And this is, this is something that I think is very little of in Europe. It's really mo been mostly happening in the United States. It's a fairly new field of research, but it's growing and spreading uh, throughout the world. And per the, the thing that's been a particular interest in this research and particular interest in my talk is how well are students learning to think like scientists as a result of, of taking courses in it and as a result of the different uh, kinds of teaching they're receiving. And so jumping ahead a little bit, looking at the body of research that, that we have, you know, I've done part of it, there are many other people working on this, we're actually in a situation that was much like medicine was um, in, the, in the 19th century, um, which is that people had these methods and you know, they be believed strongly in their effectiveness for treating patients like bloodletting and used for many hundreds of years. But, um, but then science came along and they'd done, you know, you had people like Pasteur doing research on biology and disease, and so you'd established uh, scientific principles that gave you new ways to think about treating people that were actually much more effective. And so you had this big shift and, and you know, of course doctors who'd been practicing one way and trained that way, it's not that easy to c believe that what you've been doing is completely wrong and there's a completely different way you should do it. But in fact, most of the faculty, you know, teaching staff in this room are in this position. They are practicing is essentially medieval teaching while we have research saying there's a better way to do it. So I'm gonna start out by giving you some examples showing you the kind of research uh, that results that have been obtained in this work, and then I'm gonna go into showing you why what seems like rather surprising results make complete sense when you understand the basic principles of learning that uh, have been established through re the research. So in, in this first experiment, one that I had some involved with, we looked at the, we wanted to look at the learning that takes place just in the, in the lecture. And so we got, a very large course where there were two large sections in introductory physics and these two sections were for one week taught um, 
to cover exactly the same uh, you know, material, learning objectives, in exactly the same amount of class time, one week of classes, and then they were given a surprise test right at the start of the next class that the two instructors had developed. And so the only difference between these classes is one of them was taught by someone who was a senior professor, very experienced in teaching this material, had high student ratings for his lectures, and they gave traditional lectures. The other class, was, the other section, was taught by someone who was a fairly new PhD, but had been trained through my program in these research-based ways of actually teaching. And in the, in the research-based way, I'll go into more detail later, but very quickly, the students you know, had a little short readings they were supposed to do ahead of class, and then during class, they were given questions to solve, different ways to, to answer those questions. Then they would have to talk with their f neighboring students while the instructor wandered around listening in on them. And then there was discussion by the instructor afterwards, but not lecturing ahead of time. And I want to stress that this, in this experiment, it was to test if you could cover how well you could cover the exact same amount of material in the same time, because a lot of people, when they first hear about these scientific teaching methods, think, oh, you could never cover the, the material. So this is experiment just to probe that. Okay, so we'll do a quick uh, poll of the audience here. Now, mind you, this is the, the uh, control class is taught just the same way that almost everybody in here is either teaching or being taught uh, compared to this different way. How many, raise your hand if you think the, the measured learning will be the same in the two. Nobody thinks it's the same. How about thinks the experienced lecturer will do the best? Nobody did. Oh, okay, we have a few people and the experimental would be the best? A lot more. A lot of people unwilling to make a decision. So here's, here's the response. So this is a histogram of the, the number of students versus their, their score on this test. And basically, skipping details, the amount of learning a, a student could get three with just random guessing on this. So the amount of learning is actually how far above three you are. And when you realize that, you can realize the difference here is a lot bigger than what you might uh, first guess. So the two things I want to stress. First is, you know, how little the learning is from the traditional good lecture. It's a tiny gain over just random guessing. Now, I would have been shocked to see this, except I've done other measurements on the learning people take from lecture, including early in my work on this, from my own lectures, and it wasn't much different from that. Um, the other thing I want to stress is that this entire distribution moved up. So a lot of times people say, well, these different ways of teaching, maybe they're better for the weaker students, but you know, the, the stronger students, better prepared students, they learn fine from just lectures. And this shows now that, you know, really the students who learn best from the scientific teaching are really all the ones that have a human brain, because this, this way of teaching really, it is, supports the way the human brain learns. And so, Everybody gains from it. Um, here's a, jumping to a completely different subject. This is another thing we've been doing recent research on, looking at an instructional introductory physics lab targeting learning of content. And so we found a, a bunch of different lab courses at three very different universities where those the courses were very specifically, their goals were that there was a general introductory physics course with lectures and sections and so on, but the lab was just to support the learning of that content. And we figured out a way, because there were some students who took the lab, some that didn't, and by a 
careful normalization of questions on exams that targeted lab material versus not targeted lab material, we could get a very rigorous and precise comparison of how much benefit taking these introductory labs were to actually the amount students learned. And here's the results we found from that. So here's zero here. And this is sort of complete mastery of the subject uh, from taking labs. And you can see all these nine courses I gave zero with very small error bars. And so, in fact, if you want to be, you know, nice statistical precision, there's a lot of time and a lot of money, a lot of student time goes into doing these things. We can say that they're, you know, point benefit of less than 0.006 now. Pretty much zero by anybody's measure. Now, we have gone on to study why this was the case, and we can now, we have a good understanding actually of why this is, but this is a, this is a perfect example of something that people, teachers have believed in for decades, if not centuries, which doing some careful research shows no, you know, science says, we're, you know, it's just wrong. You need to think about this differently. Um, the third example, this is looking at the learning that takes place over an entire course. Uh, the, the first semester physics course, mechanics, probably many of you have know, you know, taken or taught. And a big, a big um, focus of that is the, the concepts of you know, force and motion there. And so there's been a lot of research in physics education looking at how well students actually learn to think like physicists about those concepts as a result of successfully completing such a course. And so uh, we have some good tests for that, which ask the students to, you know, that gives them some simple real world situation they haven't seen before, like a car running into a truck, and sees how well they can apply these concepts like a physicist would to make predictions. And so in this particular uh, study, I like it because there are a lot of different instructors teaching in fairly small class uh, sections, and they collected data on this over a number of years, and they found on this test the, the uh, somebody's too outraged at my uh, results here. <laughs> uh, they, they averaged here, all of them were pretty close to scoring 0.3. Um, and then they switch to essentially this scientific teaching methods, which I'll explain more detail in just a moment. Um, and, they, and then they recorded all these different sections and instructors, and they're all up here scattered around 0.6. And so you, you have a situation in which you have the, the same instructors, the same personalities and people, they simply change what teaching methods they were using and the amount of student learning in this particular critical aspect of thinking like being able to reason like a physicist just doubled. And so, and you know, there's a lot more learning. In fact, you know, this, this one's a really striking example. This, just by changing teaching methods from lecturing to this new method, that person, students are learning six times more than they were before. Okay, I'm gonna, gonna finish just uh, to say something about advanced courses. Um, all of the, those examples and, and a lot of the uh, research in this area has focused on introductory courses. That's where most of the students are in a lot of the studies. Uh, my group and a few others have now been looking at applying and testing uh, these uh, approaches at more advanced classes, both at British Columbia and now at Stanford. Uh, for physics, the upper level courses for physics majors. And without going into details, the, the basic uh, principle or design that goes into these is one that really works for, we, we now see works for all levels, all subjects, um, and pretty much all class sizes. But in, in the ones where we get collected research on, the students are doing some uh, a little bit of advanced preparation, 
then the instructor's introducing the task, and then they work on these, these problems that they're given to work through, working in small groups, and then while the instructor's monitoring what they're doing, answering uh, questions briefly, and then periodically stopping class, discussing how people are doing, making sure everybody understands, answering questions, and then the, once everybody's on, all the students are at the same place, then moves on through the, the other activities throughout the, the class session. Okay, so does this work in advanced classes like it does in introductory? Yes, big improvement there. Um, I'll just say a little bit about some other things we've seen, particularly uh, at Stanford recently in the physics department where a number of faculty have, have introduced uh, this kind of teaching for the, the courses in the physics major sequence. And one of the things that they noticed is that the attendance in the classes went way up, which is interesting. And the student response to, to this kind of teaching, which was new to them, uh, was extremely positive. And finally, uh, we've seen that all the faculty, once they had learned to teach this way, found it much more enjoyable than teaching by the traditional lectures. And so they've all switched and all, uh, you know, are not going to ch ever change back. And in fact, we've seen uh, that's pretty typical for at this large initiative I ran where there are several hundred science faculty who've learned how to adopt these teaching methods and they also find them, they just like it much better. Um, okay, so at this point, I'm sure that a lot of you, particularly those who have been teaching this way for by lectures for many years are, have a question, and I always get it at the end, so I'll answer it now. You know, basically, people say, well, this can't, traditional lectures can't be as bad as you say, because, you know, I as a professor, you know, I was taught this way, and look at how well I turned out, or sometimes they'll point to Nobel Prize winners and so on. Um, the problem with that is, this was exactly the same reasoning that justified bloodletting as the medical treatment of choice for 2,000 years. People said, well, you know, I had bloodletting and I lived, so it must be the best way to do medical treatments, okay? The problem is, you know, that's not, you have to think about what science says. Science, like we do now with medicine, says you always have to have a control group. You have to compare two different ways of doing it. And so, you know, the, the fact is, you faculty who were taught this way with lectures, you don't realize that if you would have been more successful uh, if you had simply had different, better teaching at the time. You just don't have that comparison. And it would have meant that a lot more other students would be successful. Okay, so just to wrap up sort of the, the research part before getting more into the principles of learning part. Um, the, the research in this area it gets published in sort of specialized journals that are kind of limited in their circulation. But I've been able to trace about a thousand studies actually, and there's a big net of analysis these people published, comparing the traditional lecture approach with the sort of research based or sometimes called active learning approach. Uh, across the areas of science and, and math and engineering. And these comparisons always consistently show uh, increases of scientific teaching in both the learning and the student uh, completion and pass rate. And they show the largest differences when people are specifically testing how well students are actually learning to think like an expert like a scientist or engineer in that field. Okay, so the rest of the talk is about why these make sense, basic principles of learning that you can apply both to your teaching or if you're a student to your own learning, and what we know about this. This is sort of the cognitive psychology part. So um, I'm first gonna talk about, when I talk about you know thinking like a physicist, what it really means to think in a, as an expert in an area like physics, and what we know about how that's learned, and then 
what the research shows are, are important factors in actually learning that. And then I might say a little bit about how to apply this in teaching. Uh, so this is the area cognitive psychologists have done a lot of studies of what makes up expert thinking. And they've looked at across many, many different subjects, science, medicine, et cetera. And they've identified there's certain key features that are true across all areas uh, of expertise. And there's certain features that are uh, consistent about how to learn that. So experts have a lot of factual knowledge about their subject. That one's no surprise. But more importantly, Experts in any field like physics have a very specific way they organize all that knowledge that allows them when they're solving problems then to be able to retrieve and apply the correct knowledge efficiently uh, and effectively. And so these organizational schemes involve, you know, recognizing different relationships and when concepts, when we talk about a concept in physics, it's really the way you can take a whole bunch of different kinds of observations and, and, and results, information, and see how you can condense it down into a nice package, you know, conservation of energy, that then if you've got a problem to solve, you can very quickly decide, oh, uh, you know, conservation of energy is either going to work here or not work, and then that guides how you solve the problem. The third basic feature of expert thinking is um, ability to monitor their own thinking. And so as a physicist is a skilled physicist working through a problem, they're busy asking, regularly asking themselves, you know, is this making progress here? Yes, okay, I should continue versus, uh, no, I need to step back and look. This doesn't seem to be working. I should think about a different way to solve this problem, okay? So all of these three, and of course they're very broad in their generalization across different areas, these are, the research shows, these are fundamentally new ways of thinking. Nobody naturally comes to any subject with these. And that everyone requires many hours of intense practice to actually develop these capabilities. And for students, the, the bad news is, if you want to reach a sort of university uh, faculty member, you know, teacher level, it's actually uh, many thousands of hours of intense practice. And pretty much everybody takes co a pretty comparable amount of time for this. Now, really, it's only quite recently that, that it's become clear this requirement of so much time is fundamentally a biological requirement, that in fact, What's happening in the brain is very much like what happens if I want to build up a muscle, okay? If I want to make this muscle, uh, you know, bigger and stronger, I have to use it strenuously and over a long period of time. And in response, my body says, okay, it's going to keep using that really hard. I'm going to make it bigger and strong, that muscle bigger and stronger. It turns out the brain does very much the same thing that it actually rewires, adds new neurons, changes how neurons are connected, and it's really within this rewired brain that the expertise lies, and that's what the learning practice has to be doing. So it's a very different uh, way of, I mean, I think traditionally people would think about people have brains and you fill them up with knowledge to make them experts. What we realize now is no, you actually have to change have the kind of activities that rewire that brain so it thinks in a different way than it could before. Uh, and this is just one nice slide that shows how, how you know, we can now see this ha actually happening. Uh, this is a functional MRI looking at the brain of two people when they're interpreting an x-ray. This is a medical student who's just learning how to do this, and this is a expert radiologist, and you can see that basically their brains are, are what's being activated in their brains are fundamentally different. And, you know, if you, there are some studies where you go and you take this person over time with more and more training, their brain turns into, they, you see them acting more and more like that. And so, so you really have to worry, you know, too much of the time uh, in teaching 
the university level, people are worried about the curriculum, you know, what courses are covered and what topics are covered. That really is just tells you what knowledge students are getting. But it's the, t what, what the research is making very clear, the teaching methods are really what changes the brain, develops the thinking that allows students to learn uh, when and how to actually use that knowledge in more meaningful ways. So, okay, what goes into, what has to go into this kind of proper uh, teaching to get, uh, you know, what I call effective learning? Well, this actually, a, uh, this is a summary of kind of all the research on, <laughs> on learning in this area there is. Uh, the key part here is, is that I want to emphasize is basically th this is the, the <coughs> learning that takes place by the, the, the student, the learner, going through and practicing the expert thinking that you want them to learn. And while they're doing that, they're getting feedback on that practice. And the feedback has to be very specifically, uh, it has to be timely, specific, and actionable. So the learner has to be able to see, you know, while they still can remember how they're thinking, what they're doing wrong, how can they change it? to actually get better. So those are the critical things that have to happen, uh, practicing expert thinking and with good feedback, but we know a bunch of things that have to go into the design to make that work, starting with the disciplinary expertise. This is where the, the subject expertise of the teacher is really important to know what kind of activities and practice the student should be doing, and then these are various things that you know, the right level for the student's background, motivation, and brain constraints. I'll say a little more about. Um, okay, so what goes into designing those practice activities? Well, like I said, prior, you know, they have to be the right level to be hard but not impossible for the students given what they, uh, their background. But I want to focus more on what, is, what are the thinking skills that they need to be practicing? What really is, is special about how a physicist thinks that we want students to learn and how they can learn it? And it's really, you can think about, okay, it's gotta be the right kind of brain exercised. Um, and so you think through this, and this is something my own group's doing a lot of research on right now, is it's really the decisions that a a person would make when sol an expert would make when solving a physics problem or frankly a you know biology or chemistry problem um, and so if you try and think about okay what are those decisions well you know given some new situation a new problem they're starting first deciding what concepts and uh, models apply in this situation what are the key features you need to pay attention to what information's relevant in that situation, uh, what's irrelevant, and what's needed to actually go about solving it. And then deciding, you know, in this situation, oh, I can make this simplification or approximation or not, depending on how you, how you justify it. So these are the things that, in any real authentic physics problem, not some artificial back of the textbook problem, that a physicist immediately does anytime they're faced with a new problem. Um, and then this goes on deciding on what potential solutions to pursue, deciding the best way to represent the information. Each subfield has its specialty to basically help understand things. And then there's literally about 33 more that we've identified decisions that go through in this process down to when you get an answer or conclusion and then there's the decision about, uh, you know, is this right? How can I test? What are the good ways to test? And does it pass all of these tests? And so if you're a student out there, you want to really be thinking about, as you're working through problems, which of these decisions are you actually making? In many cases, you'll find the problems you're given are very artificial and frankly kind of pointless because you won't be given the opportunity to make those decisions. You know, if I look at the back of most textbooks, they'll tell you, you know, you'll know it's the 
conservation of energy chapter, so you'll know what concepts you have to apply. They'll give you all the information you need to solve it, no information that you don't need to solve it. Um, and so you, all those things have been taken away from you. You need to go ahead and say, no, I shouldn't spend that much time on this kind of problem. I had to think of some other real problems and practice this kind of thinking that you have in real problems. Uh, that's really the, the way you're going to actually learn much more meaningfully. Um, now, I want to also stress that research, and this is some recent work that we've been looking at particularly, but many others have shown, that it's really critical for the, the learner to actually practice making the decision. And we have some data here where we had a control group where it's like most teaching where it's sort of the instructor will say, oh, you need to think about, you know, deciding on this. Here's what that decision, you know, here's the example of what a good decision would be and telling them the answer to that decision. Compared to the, the experimental class, we had the students, here's the decision you have to make. Make that decision. And they would make it and they'd be good or bad, it would vary, and then you'd have to, they would be able to see how good or bad that decision was. When we compared those two on future learning on other physics tasks, the results were just enormous, actually. The ones who actually, you know, make, practicing making the decision, even when they were wrong, turned out to be enormously more effective in, in future problem solving, in future thinking like physicists. Okay, so I've sort of covered the importance of these. I'll say just a little bit about motivation. Uh, that's obvious or fairly obvious, but I want to stress that the, the work we're talking about, the practicing thinking through these activities, that's, I said it has to be hard or it's not going to be effective. So it's fundamentally hard work. And the... You know, anything that's hard work, people do a lot better if they're motivated, they see value in putting in that effort. And so a lot of times I'd say motivation gets neglected, but motivation is something the, the teachers have a lot of control over and can make learning a lot better if they, if they think about it. Um, so we know quite a lot from research about motivation. I would say that the most important uh, lesson in this context is just to think about the, the choice of context in which the material's presented. And so rather than give it as some totally abstract artificial thing students can't see any point to or any value where this would be, think of how you can have a real problem that's interesting, relevant to students, and then show how these physics ideas come in to help them solve that problem. That, you know, that's just a, a broad scope of things that make motiva uh, that motivate people to, to actually dig in and learn things. Uh, there's some other things about motivation we know uh, that I'll skip over now. Finally, the last thing I want to talk about in these, cons in these basic uh, features that go into designing good learn teaching activities is brain constraints. And this is something actually that's important for everybody and students in uh, particular to learn about because uh, these aren't obvious, but they make a difference all the time. So the first one is the working memory. It turns out the brain sort of, you can think of memory in the brain kind of two parts. There's the long-term uh, memory. It has, that's what most of us think about memory, enormous capacity, works for a long time. And then there's what's called the short-term working memory. It's kind of a short-term buffer. Uh, and it's really what uh, deals with remembering and processing information on short time scales, like you would encounter in a, in a physics or chemistry math class, okay? Turns out this, this working memory has a very limited capacity, sort of five to seven new items, okay? And it's even worse than that because it's kind of like a computer with very little RAM. And so the more th 
new things it's called upon to do, the less it can really function and process at all, and therefore the less it learns. And so, um, as it turns out, there's a lot of things that teachers do without realizing it, they're really quite harmful to learning because of this. You know, when they introduce some new technical term and they realize, yeah, it's not very important, but I'll just put it up there because it won't hurt, uh, or some nice pretty picture of something just because it's nicer graphics, or even when they go off on some little side story or, or, or a little joke, which everybody thinks, oh, must be good because it gets students' attention. The fact is, all of these things use up working memory and actually hurts the learning of the, what you intended. And there's, you know, you, you might, I know a lot of people just have trouble believing this. Take my word for it, this is an area very thoroughly studied and these, exactly these kinds of things have been demonstrated. Um, and I will say that this is one thing, place where students can help themselves. This advanced preparation, going reading the textbook, for example, to cover all the technical terms that might be introduced, uh, that frees up in class. You've already got that there, and so it frees up your memory for processing what's being told. Um, the second thing has to do with what's important for getting long-term retention in long-term memory. And here again, it's kind of surprising uh, result, which is it's not actually remembering it, we call it encoding it, getting it into the nerves in the first place, that's the hard part of remembering. It's actually the failure later on to recall, you know, days, weeks, to recall the right information. And it's because what happens is basically you put this, store this information through some nerve connections here, but as you learn new information, there's a bunch of other connections coming in there. And so then when you go and try and recall it, all those new connections interfere and you end up getting the wrong stuff when you try and recall. And you know, you can actually test yourself on something like this if you go and you know, do some activity talking to some friend, inter, inter, you know, interviewing some people, and then and see what you remember, and then interview four more people right afterwards. At the end of the day, try and sort out. You can't remember, you know, they're all mixed up together because of this interference in the brain. And so, how, how is this fixed? Well, this is something teachers can fix. It's also some, something students can fix. If you go and you think back as you're learning new material. You keep thinking back to the old material. And so it's, uh, and how, so how it's similar, how it's different from what new material coming in. That, that regular repetition of recall actually suppresses this uh, interference. And so you'll keep, you'll do much better long-term remembering all these things. For the physicists in the audience, this is actually a, beautiful and, and pretty much perfect analogy to producing a quantum superposition state and then later on you get some superposition but if you do regular quantum measurements in the middle you suppress all those other other states and so you get a nice pure recall but if you're not a physicist you don't need to worry about that <laughs> just remember you know, as you're going through different topics in a course, don't just figure if you learn this, it's all done. You have to, as you're getting new things, think back to the old things and how they're connected. Um, okay, so let me say just a little bit about then what research has shown is the best implementation procedures of putting, how to put these into class. Um, so I talked about you have to design these good questions or tasks for students to work on, both in class, but then also in homework and so on. Um, and they have to involve expert thinking, but also they need to have deliverables. Uh, students actually have to produce something. And that, that works in a couple of ways. First, it, it defines really what they have to do better, but also 
get to make sure that they actually are doing it, going through the process. And then finally, those deliverables are really essential for the instructor to be seeing actually what students are doing so that can tell them how to make better feedback on, on the student learning. And the second one is this idea that learning in groups, and turns out we've seen that, okay, if you have in class really any size from this on down, people can talk, three or four of them can talk together, and that, that actually is, a, is very beneficial. Um, and I think, again, one's, it goes rather against one's intuition. I think a lot of intuition, both students and teachers, is, well, if you have students talking together like this, mostly it's just helping the weaker students because the stronger, better prepared students can just tell them what the answer is. And in fact, it, it doesn't actually work that way. I mean, the, the first benefit to this is that the students, when they're trying to work through, can get much more immediate targeted feedback, you know, some little problem there, part they're stuck on or forgot about. They can quickly, another student can help them, and so there's a lot less time just people being stuck and, and trying to work through the problem. Um, so it makes the process more efficient. But more importantly than that is, in research and in my own studies, we see that we can have groups where initially none of them knew the right answer, all of them were wrong. Through the process of talking to each other, a large fraction will actually come up with the right answer. What's happening there is, again, something that cognitive psychologists have studied quite a bit, which is that the, pro the actual process of explaining or, try or teaching someone else, even thinking that you're preparing to teach someone else, triggers a fundamentally different mental processing activity than simply thinking about it on your own. And this kind of different thinking process that kicks in actually contributes to learning. So this is this kind of a surpri really surprising, non-intuitive, but now well-documented result. And finally, having these students talk to each other is really useful as a teacher because you can go listen in on those conversations and therefore know much more about what thinking is going on in the students' brains, what they've got right, what they've got wrong, and then make your teaching much more efficient and targeted from listening in on them. Okay, so let me just uh, give you an example of how to make all this work, this practice with effective feedback uh, in, a, in a class. And I'll, I think most people can sort of see how it's easier in a smaller class. So I'm going to give you an example of doing it in a course, a class that's that this side lecture hall here. So let's say I'm teaching about basic electricity and voltage to introductory students. So start, they have a little targeted pre-class reading. I don't expect them to, to really learn the physics from this, but it gives them the basic phenomena and terminology so that they're better prepared to actually start working in class. And then class doesn't start with a lecture telling them stuff, it starts with questions. And so, for example, I would give them this question with a circuit with batteries and light bulb here uh, and ask them if I close that switch, what's going to happen to the brightness of that bulb? And since this is a big class, I want to make sure all the students are involved and I want to monitor how they're thinking at some level. I make sure that every student has a clicker, personal response system uh, device, if you're not familiar with them. They look sort of like this with four buttons on them. And so then I give the question, every student has to think about, it, press the button they think corresponds to the answer and my computer records who they were and what answer they chose. Now, at one level, this is useful just for me as an instructor. I can see, oh, everybody already knows this or nobody knows this. But probably more importantly is that this, the students having to make an answer like this, this is just general psychology of everybody, where they have to uh, uh, commit to something in which they have some level of accountability for, really focuses their thinking much more intently and prepares them to learn better for the future. So the learning then starts taking place when 
I don't show them the vote, don't tell them the result. Rather, I just have them talk again and, uh, with their neighbors here and it's the reasoning and then re-vote. And while they're doing that, as I said before, I'd be walking up and down the aisles, listening in on those groups, getting little snapshots of their thinking about this problem. And then go ahead and demonstrate what happened, show them the result, and more importantly, then have a follow-up summary and discussion where I go over what thinking and, and models they're using were right, and more importantly, what thinking uh, was incorrect and why, which I've been able to detect from listening in on them and seeing what answers they chose. And I want to stress this, this last one about what's incorrect and why. It turns out, you know, again, sort of intuitively in the way it almost always happens in teaching is you students do something, the instructors see that it was, you know, there was a, a, something about it was wrong, so say, oh, this is wrong, here's the right answer, okay? Turns out that produces very little learning. Uh, where learning really takes place is when people have something wrong, but then they're led to understand what was incorrect, what about their thinking was incorrect, and how they could change it to be right in the future. And so it turns out, it, you know, for producing learning, it's much more important to focus on the incorrect answers, uh, as long as there's a significant number, than on the correct answers. Okay, now, getting back to, you know, the whole point here is, I want them to be practicing like physicists with good feedback. Let me, let's go through the thinking they have to be doing, you know? They're given this new, situ this new situation here. They've got to decide, you know, what's relevant, what's re irrelevant in it. They've got to formulate or think about what their basic conceptual model of how electricity works and interacts in light bulbs. And then they've got to test that as to what it would actually make happen with the switch closed. And they critique both their own reasoning and alternative reasoning provided by fellow students uh, through these discussions. So this whole idea of, you know, given a problem, deciding what concepts apply, testing out how arguing with other physicists, you know, as to whether this is suitable or not, you know, this is what physicists spend, you know, research physicists, that's what they spend their lives doing. And so this is exactly practicing that kind of thinking. And meanwhile, they're getting multiple forms of feedback to help them improve uh, that thinking. They're getting it from the interaction with other students. They're getting it from comparing their predictions with what actually uh, happened. And they're getting it, most importantly, from the informed instructor who's very targeting, going over what, you know, right, where they're still thinking about it, what aspects of thinking are right or what are wrong. And it's really, you know, so that's really exactly what went into this teaching, and that's really what explains these differences. And when you think about then how the students are practicing thinking and getting feedback compared to when they're sitting to a less listening to a lecture, they aren't rewiring their brain, these kind of results uh, make complete sense. Um, so I'm going to just uh, skip over this uh, part. I'm going to just talk about one specific feature here, this, because this is something that's a very common mistake in teaching, and it is something that students can actually, on their own, deal with. Um, well, to some extent. So the standard teaching practice, that, and again, it's very intuitive, once you're an expert in the subject, is you go in and, okay, you want to teach some talk of topic, and so you'll explain to, to students the, you know, the basic principles, the definitions, the terminology, the equations to use, and so on, and then show students how to apply those uh, to solving problems and then give them problems to solve. You know, what could be wrong with this? It seems the most natural thing in the world. The problem, there's a, two big problems. First is, all that formalism of beginning student, they have no idea what this is for, so it's just a bunch of stuff to memorize. There's no, so it's not very motivating, don't, don't see any use or value to it. Uh, but even worse, it's a bad 
organization of knowledge, this is the critical aspect of, of expert thinking, is that the way this is presented, since I don't know what this is used for, it's just random separate pieces of information that they just have to try and memorize as, as separate things. And so this basically overwhelms that working memory that I talked about, uh, doesn't allow them to process. Um, but if instead you flip this around and you start out by presenting, here's an interesting, important problem you need to solve, and then bring in all these formalisms and equations and principles as tools for solving that problem, then that's how experts think about it, and that develops and in students. They see how these things are linked together. It basically give, helps give them this expert organization of knowledge uh, and particularly if you focus on what are the key features of this problem that require this particular concept, this particular knowledge, et cetera. So I'm going to skip over uh, another example later that elaborates on this, but there's this really dramatic and, and a profound study which uh, some cognitive psychologists did in which they, they did an experiment where they did the traditional way of, okay, explain all the ideas to the students and then have them practice doing problems versus practicing, trying to do these problems, which of course they didn't know enough to do, but they could think hard about what might be important and work on it. And then, but that really prepared them to then be, to, they were told the same thing as in the first case, but just after they looked at it, uh, there's a, actually there's a factor, they measured a factor of 10 difference in the learning, if the students had had some way of preparing their brains to learn by looking at the problem versus the other way around. It's very traditional. Uh, okay, so I'll skip over this. This is just, because I've already talked about later stuff interfering. Uh, I've talked about the importance of good feedback being not just give the correct answer, but help with what the wrong answer is. So. With that, I'll, I'll stop here. Um, this sort of argue for this scientific approach to teaching and learning is, you know, the research shows it's much more effective way to teach. It also leads to a very different and better way to evaluate teaching. Just like in medicine, we don't, you know, are doctors using the most up-to-date, scientifically tested methods? Here, we can look at our teachers using the most up-to-date scientifically tested methods. Uh, and this has the potential to really radically improve university education, and I think with lots of benefits uh, as a result. So if you want to learn more about this, first I'll make sure my slides are available, but here's some of my uh, favorite references in general, <coughs> ideas about learning, and then a bunch of specific resources here for instructors on how to implement particular practices. Thank you. Well, well, is the time for questions? We don't finish. We have some minutes for questions. Thank you. We have some uh, minutes for questions. Is the time for question and discussion? So we have here the first one. Please, the microphone. Is in this. Okay. What yes, could please. We, what could we have access to the slides? Sorry. Yeah. 
Where could we uh, have access to the slides? Where are the copies of the slides available? Uh, yeah, so once to know where the slides will be available, uh, I'll... Let me, let me answer. Uh, maybe yeah, I can answer. Perfect. I, I think we can have them in, the, in our web page, in the front page in the physics uh, page. Okay. Another one? Is, is there another person who can have the, another uh, microphone on the other yeah. side just to mm -hmm. save running around? I don't know where the I other microphone went. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, this is very inefficient, and so what I'm going to suggest, if you have a question, why don't you sort of go and stand in the aisle, and then we can go through okay. uh, uh, more quickly I, than running around. I can't get out. Uh, yeah, that's fine. You're, right. you're good. Um, so, realistically, assuming that this won't be implemented anytime soon, what can we do as students? I mean, you mentioned groups, but what else could we do in, individually? So. I think what you have to think about doing is, uh, you know, okay, your teacher isn't doing this for you, but what really matters in any case is, I mean, the learning is all what happens in your brain, okay? And so you can go ahead and, you know, sort of do a lot of this on yourself, uh, by yourself. So, you know, if we, if we kind of run through the different aspects of it, you know, where you're given problems to solve that don't have you make any choices. Think about, okay, what if I didn't have that information here, you know? Pick, let me try and pick some different situation and think, what would happen there? And now you have to start thinking yourself, okay, how do I know what concept would apply there? How would I test if this answer, all those decisions I left, you know? See about, can you make those decisions and, and what would they be? discuss them with fellow students. You can even ask the, you know, ask the teacher that. So, you know, that part you can do as you're covering new material, you can continually go back and think, okay, how is this similar? How is this different to what we had before? Uh, when I look at a problem, how, how I do, do I decide these concepts are important? What are the key features here? Uh, when you're introduced to some formalism, rather than just sit there and try and memorize it, you can either decide on yourself or you can inter jump up and interrupt and say, what kind of useful problem would this actually be good for? You know, so there's, so just, you, you can actually think about how to implement these kind of, the mental activities we're talking about here in different ways on your own, uh, especially, you know, use a little creativity but even just thinking about it is going to actually help you because it'll sort of focus on what you need to be doing to really learn. Okay. Thanks. There is another question just next. Uh, Way in back up there. Um, Anybody over here? Uh, yeah. Okay. So we yeah. so we've got two microphones yeah. moving at the same time. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the talk. Okay. It was very inspirational and probably hold it a little closer to your mouth. Closer. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the talk. It was inspirational and educational. I hope it was better for the professors and for students. <laughs> uh, my question is related to your perception on how immersive techniques can be part of these new methods of teaching and learning. For example, using uh, virtual reality. Just want to know your opinion. Uh, yeah, okay. I'll answer that while you give him back the mic and he can be taking it way back to the back where they want. So, the, the use of virtual reality, other technology things, uh, almost always uh, are, is oversold, overclaimed. Uh, the reality is that educational technology can be of value, but usually it isn't. And the times when it is of value is really where people are thinking about what's the learning, what's the thinking that a learner and the, what feedback they need you know, needs to be happening, and then how can I bring in technology to actually support that? And so, you know, simple things like personal response systems, that's good. Virtual reality, you have to think, okay, that, how is that really going to help any? In physics things, I don't think it's going to help at all. 
you know, you can imagine in some other disciplines where you're struggling to visualize 3D configurations, it could be useful, but, you know, the solution is never, here's a technology, I must be able to use it somehow. It never turns out to work that way. It's, it has to be worked the other way around. Okay, over there. Here, yeah, another. Thank you for <clears throat> this wonderful talk and this research. Sorry about my voice. It's probably from all the lecturing I do in spite <laughs> of your research. <clears throat> I would like to ask you about uh, those uh, laboratory practices the, uh, on which you, you have several very nice papers, very, very striking ones. As a student of physics, I always found them extremely boring and excruciating. And when I taught in different universities, even in the U.S., I, I found them just the same. They are not very different from what we have here, and I don't find any value in them now. Now we know why. So my, my quest, I would like to ask you to, to show us some, some examples how, how laboratories can be restructured. I talked to some friends who teach in small universities where they have few students. They have excellent ideas. When, when you have one professor and three or four students, I could imagine that. But we have two dozen students per instructor in, 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 in laboratories. Okay, so yeah, this is talking about introductory labs and how they can be made better. So first, quickly, why are they not effective here? Well, in the cases we're talking about learning content, you know, go back to the decision making and the thinking involved that involved the physics content. That all went into the design of the, you know, the instructor designing the experiment. In terms of what the students have to do, it's just following a bunch of steps. They don't bring in any physics thinking at all to follow those steps, and that's why they're not learning it. Um, so uh, my group, and really led by Natasha Holmes, who's just started as an assistant professor in physics at Cornell, has really been the pioneer of think rethinking physics labs. And we're convinced that they just aren't the a proper or, or optimum way for actually learning physics content. So you just shouldn't even try to, to do that with, with labs. Uh, you can do it in a different context where you have project labs, where people have to explore some physics idea and they have to actually design and carry out the experiment. That's quite different, but that's also not something you do with, you know, a thousand students like we, you have or we have a, at, at Stanford. What we're convinced um, is the, uh, really the, uh, some way that labs can be uniquely effective is what we talk about is quantitative critical thinking. Thinking about how data, you know, looking at models and does data support or refute models and, or do different two data sets uh, agree or not agree with each other and thinking about that in a scientific way. And you know, these days with global warming discussions and so on, that's really an important skill for everybody to have. And what we see is um, the way to teach that really is to go through that, uh, think back to that decision process. And so you have people, you know, you give them some model and you say, here's an apparatus, think about how to take data to, to test if that model is right. So they're told they have to make that decision, but they're not told what that decision is. They, they have to decide what would be the right data to take and how would I take it, and then they, they make that decision, then they have a chance to reflect on what was the implications of that, how would they take, improve their data, or how would, they, how would they need to modify the model. And so it's a whole sequence of them simply making those basic decisions about you know, what data should be taken, how good is the data, and how could that data uh, be improved in these data, data, and data model comparisons. And so uh, we, we have actually several publications. If you look at the Physics Today reference on that, we give some, and then uh, we have another paper that's in the review process be coming out soon that also goes into a lot of detail, but, but start with looking at our January uh, Physics Today uh, discusses a lot of these ideas. Okay. In this, 
Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for the talk. It was very informative. And um, I wanted to ask about, um, from what I understood of this new experimental method, is that it relies heavily on group sessions and group discussions. However, as someone who's been in high school like the rest of us, everybody knows the story of group of whatever number of people, one does the work, the rest just signs the paper. So my question is, how does this method guarantee that not happening, or how would it work in a way that motivates everyone to still take part in equal measures um, and collaborate in the exact same way without one person carrying all the charge? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this is a really important issue of the implementation details. You know, it's, it's one thing to have a principle of design, and then it's another to have it actually work in implementation. And so that is part of the studies that have been done. Uh, and it really goes to, you You have to do partic and, and you know, everybody's had examples of bad <laughs> group interactions. So, but the, the research tells us there's a bunch of things you have to put in place. You have to keep the group size modest, like I say, three, three or, or four. Uh, and then you have to have very specific deliverables that involve both individual deliverables. Every individual student has to do something and group deliverables that a group has to then also provide. So, uh, and there has to be established sort of norms of behavior within the group. So these are all things, if, if you look at the, this website, we talk, you know, that's the place where we put in there a little two-page guides on these implementation details. Uh, and, you, you know, you're absolutely right. It has to be, it can be done wrong and it doesn't work, but we've established that there are certain things, if you do those right, you consistently, uh, it'll, you know, not absolutely every case, but a very high probability of working right. But it, it you know, just telling you folks go off and work on this as a group is not, uh, yeah, not gonna do it. Any more than if I told them, you know, go off and build a Bose-Einstein condensation apparatus. You know, there's just, there's a bunch of expertise that goes into the teaching. Okay, Adolfo. Thank you very much for, <clears throat> okay. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I'm here. Okay, I'm for, lost, where are you? <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just wanted to ask a question. Uh, you have produced tests we show clearly that this uh, scientific or more scientific approach to teaching is very effective. Yeah. But have you tried to compare how would be the situation uh, among more experimental subjects and more theoretical subjects? I mean, would be the, the, the approach equally effective or it is more effective in subjects which have a, a more a higher experimental component? Uh, so there's questions about well, more experimental, more theoretical. But, you know, I, I guess I, the, the quick answer is no. I, I can't think of any place where that's actually been, you know, directly tested. It's pretty hard to see. I mean, all the physics courses that I can think of, there's always some kind of mixture of both. Uh, so... You know, we, we have done research on laboratory courses in particular, where it's entirely about laboratories and, and, and experiments. Uh, and, you know, there's, we, we see that the same fundamental principles apply, but the, you know, the decision and the thinking involved has to be targeted to those, you know, what the thinking is you want people to use in that environment. But in, in more general courses, I, get, I guess I, it's hard for me to actually see much of a, dis, you know, how I could classify courses very clearly in that way. Uh, maybe, maybe there are in this country, but in, the, in North America, they tend to be kind of standardized and, you know, predominantly theoretical, I would say. I think, for instance, imagine a general relativity course. Yeah. Or astrophysics or quantum electrodynamics. Of course, you can do experiments, but one has to go to a laboratory I, with an I accelerator. Mean, you know, <laughs> we, we, we've seen this apply almost exactly using that same model that I illustrated from, you know, first year mechanics for non 
physics students up through quantum field theory for graduate and seems to work pretty much over that whole range pretty well. So. Thank you. Okay, the last question. Yes, thank you. Here. Ah. Yeah, uh, we, we teachers in practice face a, a very a very prosaic but practical question, which is that of rating. Um, I wonder whether that is a, an issue you have addressed in your uh, research uh, activity. Grading, how to grade? Because all this is very nice, but you know, many students, by the end of the day, what they want is to know how the exam will be. Yeah, okay. so the grading is a really uh, important element in students' lives, certainly. Um, but what, the first thing you have to realize is it's a completely arbitrary thing. Uh, you know, there's no objective standard. It, what, you know, you, you teach a course, what you feel is mastery of that subject is, can be quite different than if she teaches that same course, her, her definition of what mastery means. That there's, that, that so, so, you know, the, the grades given out, like I say, are in fact quite arbitrary and so, one just has to recognize, you know, from my research perspective, that's just an arbitrary thing. It's a kind of more an individual selection and choice. Uh, and I see, and you know, really unfortunate when I dug into at the at the universities in the U.S. where it's really not monitored much at all. You know, you can see enormous differences in the fraction of students who fail the same course just with a new instructor you know with I know the students are much the same but a new instructor thinks they should fail a lot more of them than the old one did and so that just tells you it's kind of painful as a student to live with that arbitrariness but it's there and so there's a couple of there's a couple of elements of this though that I think are important to to take into account. Uh, one is that when we study uh, what e the traditional exam is, where you kind of, you know, lock a student in the room, don't let them use any resources, um, that's not really a very uh, valid measure of what they actually know about the subject because it's so artificial compared to, you know, real problem solving in the field. And so study, when people do studies on that, traditional exams, you know, although they're very important, they do predict it, how students will do on other exams, they're not very good at predicting what they do on any kind of real uh, later activity. Um, so my own belief about grading, and this is now a belief, this is not a research study, is that students have been heavily, you know, conditioned to believe Grades are really what matters. And so as an effective teacher, you really should have, gr you associate grades with everything you know it's good for students to do for their learning. That's the way you tell them it's important. And so that's quite a different philosophy, but it's likely to be the most effective way to getting learning of you want them to do all these different things, prepare for class, et cetera, you attach some grading points to, to do that as really just your way of signaling what's important given that your, your actual grade you give them is, is not very meaningful. Let, let me ask just okay. one point on this grading. Well, let me, let's see if other people have other questions, unless it's real quick. Uh, yes. One, yeah, let's, one, I, I can talk to you later about grading. Greetings, well, the, la the last question, because well, uh, we have, the yes, this we one. Have one over there and one over here. Uh, okay, uh, another one here. Yes. Uh, we have no time. Oh. Okay, thank you very much for the very illuminating talk. I have a question on the on the on how to measure the results or the effectiveness of the teaching. Uh, I wonder if a traditional exam, but in fact, uh, make the, the experienced teacher to win <laughs> over the new PhD holder. And somehow, if traditional exams are blocking the, the, all these possibilities of improving the, the teaching with new methods. Um, so that's, um, that's a hard uh, thing to say any 
generalize. I think to, to a large extent it is, but that has an awful lot to do with how you, you design your exams, what you put on the exams, how students are prepared for, for those exams. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the reality is that I've actually started looking at exams. And exams are, so in general, people, when people have studied this, as I say, the students, um, students' performance on these, you know, isolated kind of artificial environment exams aren't very good predictors of how they're going to perform in future, you know, real world tasks and for understandable reasons. Uh, but it's actually worse than that because when I go and look at the actual exams that people make, it generally and certainly in all the universities I've looked at, the instructors have no real guidance and understanding and never get any feedback on the quality of their exams. And so when I look at the exams from sort of a, you know, a, an expert education, these questions are just awful. You know, a lot of times I understand what they intended to ask, but the actual wording and the way it'd be interpreted by a student, something completely different. Uh, and so, you know, even, even with the best of intentions, they're just not, not skilled enough to make them even come close to being useful. So to, to me, <laughs> looking at them, that sort of dominates, you know. I, I'm, I've been going crazy with the, actually, <laughs> I'll say a little bit, the person who teaches the big introductory physics course at Stanford now because, you know, he does a pretty good job until his exams and the questions, they are totally different with all kinds of strange artificial features to them that he sort of thinks they're useful. And mostly the students are just, you know, what kind of problem is this? You know, it's just a completely different thing. And so what he's testing on is who knows what is really measuring in terms of learning. It's certainly nothing that they would have been getting practicing before. So it, exams are a real problem, uh, but the quality and meaningful of the exams is probably the biggest uh, barrier there to start with. Okay, a couple of these look more like student ages here. But <laughs> well, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, you have explained how teaching someone actually helps your learning. But my question is, what is the exact mechanism of this? Like, do you have to actually teach someone to make this work? Or actually, just what? After, actually what? Uh, teach someone. Do you oh, have to teach oh, someone? the process of yes. teaching, yes. Or just yeah. condensing your knowledge into something yeah. you can explain. Yeah. So, so th this has been looked at quite a lot. And give her the last question. Not enough women have been asking questions, so. Um, so um, the process is really um, that when people are th thinking about teaching something, so they don't have to teach it. They just have to actually be thinking they're going to teach it. People, it, it generates a, a pr process of kind of stepping back, imagining how someone else would think about it, and that tends to make you sort of have a generalization of the ideas. You step back, you think how they'd fit together in different, you know, how the ideas would fit together. You think about what might be confusing about the ideas and better ways to explain it. In that process, you're actually working through the material yourself in this different kind of more general way. This is what happens. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the speech. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> My, uh, my question is the thing that why this method is good is that you get a deeper learning on a deeper knowledge about what you're learning but uh, it has a problem that I think students can get they get the same learning the same knowledge about that if they work the same way but at home and if you do that you can still, well, you need more resources to, to, to apply that method because you need more time 
and you can learn as much concepts as with the actual method. Um, so, I mean, people worry about how can you, it takes more time and so on. And, you know, we've studied that and it's just not true. That there's enormous, it's actually quite the opposite. That in, you know, the great majority of lecture time is just wasted from the point of view of learning. And so, so this is actually, I would argue, substantially more efficient. You produce because the student brains are spending more time doing what's necessary for learning uh, and less time doing inefficient things. So ultimately, yeah, this is, this is actually saves time, uh, makes it more efficient. So. More questions? Okay, we finish and thank you very much for your great presentation.